And now with the, with the perfect timing that she so often has, uh, Joy Mukherjee has literally just walked in the room. And, um, and I want to first say just really thanks, because if I understand it, um, you literally just got back from like holiday last night, got, in a, you know, got up at some awful hour this morning, and then uh, with flight delays came here, and then are leaving like midday today. So it was really just um, with an incredible generosity to be here um, with us this morning. So I'm really um, so pleased and honored to um, welcome Joya. She is a longtime friend and a passionate leader in the fight for social justice and health for all, and she's really one of my inspirations. Um, for those of you that don't know her, Joya um, has served as the Chief Medical Officer at Partners in Health since 2000, and she has been absolutely instrumental in advancing Partners in Health in, um, in its founding belief in health as a basic human right. Um, she provides strategic guidance on the implementation of programs at PIH's sites, including Haiti, Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, Peru, Mexico, Russia, and more. Um, she's played a key role in making them a global leader in the scale up of HIV treatment and MDR TB treatment in resource poor settings. And she's also a leader in um, health workforce development. Um, she's also an associate professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and she teaches infectious diseases, global health delivery, and, and human rights um, to health professionals and students. Um, she has also been a really powerful voice. If you've seen some of what she has sent out on behalf of Partners in Health, and uh, she's been a powerful voice to protect health care in this country as well. And uh, I guess I say if there's one thing you really need to know is she's one of the smartest and most passionate advocates in the world on the right of people living in poverty to health care and social and economic justice, and everything she does is guided by that passion. So welcome, Joya. It's really great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's only a few places in the world that you get to be like a social justice rock star, you know what I mean? Um, short hair or long hair? What do you think? Short, yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Where's Vincent? Is he here? There he is, my intern, my summer intern extraordinaire. Um, and Melchiades, mwah. Gracias, gracias. So um, thank you all for being here. You're really heroes. You are heroes. We have to fight this crazy administration. I mean, and the, 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 the government. So I you know, as Joanne was so generously saying, I, I asked her if she had heard from my mom for that or an introduction. But as Joanne was <laughs> kindly saying, I've spent my whole life working on um, treatment access for poor people in the developing world, in poor countries, in impoverished countries. Um, and then here we are in this country that has some of the worst health inequalities, and that is with ACA, right? We have some of the worst health inequalities in the world, and with the what I consider relatively minimalistic protections of ACA that we have to save, but we have to push for something far, far better in the United States. So um, I want to talk for about 10 minutes, right? And then we're going to do question and answer. So I, I, I don't... It's hard for me to talk for 10 minutes because I, there's so much to say. So um, so I'm going to just reflect, since you all saw the movie, what I think I'll do is just reflect on what you saw in the movie from my perspective and then tell you a little bit about what I, where I think we are now and at this moment. Um, it is not possible to win a fight without activism. There, it's just not possible. Okay, and I'm a medical doctor, and I, you know, at Harvard and places like that, there's this intense focus on research and data. It's very important, but it's never really won an argument, in my opinion, without a fight. So, uh, you know, when I started my work in HIV, I was living in Uganda. Um, I, had, I was a newly minted physician, and there was no HIV treatment at all, none, um, for people in Africa or the United States. So this was prior to the cocktail that you later saw that St. Care and Adeline and others had, um, had access to. And what 
I was doing was HIV prevention with young people, people from 11 to 14 years old, um, and really teaching them how AIDS was transmitted, what they could do to prevent it. We were in schools and we were showing children how to use condoms. You know, many, many plantains were injured in um, <laughs> that era. Um, and so, what we, what we learned, though, what I learned, the most important lesson, and I you know, have had access to excellent education in the public schools of New York, Michigan, uh, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, all public school educated, excellent education. But what I learned was the most important lesson from these children, from 11 to 14 years old. Because after training these young girls um, and boys, but particularly the girls were the most savvy and sophisticated, and at that age, of course, the development gap between boys and girls is pretty notable. And we asked the kids, okay, now put together your list of the top five reasons you might be at risk for HIV, and then we're going to help you develop songs and drama to do a curriculum when you go back to your home schools. And this was across 92 schools in Western Uganda at the height of the AIDS epidemic there in 94. And in all 92 schools, all the children, hundreds and hundreds of children, their top risk factor was poverty. And I could have said, oh, they didn't understand, right? They're ignorant, they didn't understand the training. But instead, I said, tell me what you mean by that. Teach me. And they said, you know, auntie, school is not free. And if there's some man in my community, I'm already an orphan because my mother died of HIV, my father died of HIV. And if there's somebody in my community who will pay for my school, and they want to have a relationship with me, a sexual relationship, that's a choice I'm going to have to make. That's essentially what they were saying. Because it is important for me to learn to read and write. And so what I realized, what I learned from those children is that poverty is completely wrapped up with health, with choice, and the whole concept of agency. You know, what choices you make are absolutely determined by the economy you live in. Um, and that's true in the United States. It's true around the world. And that is why results is so important. Because working on these issues that affect poverty around the world is, health is just a thermometer for that. Right? Health, it, health is the canary in the coal mine that people are living in. The, the, the oppression of poverty that is worldwide and that unfortunately is in every country and in greater extents where there is more inequality, uh, you know, especially in wealthy countries, the, the, the poverty is really marked by inequality and in very poor countries there's just a lot of poverty. And so when I came back to the United States, that's the year that you see Eric Sawyer in Vancouver. That was the year we suddenly had access to this cocktail of drugs in the United States. And I was already an HIV doctor, and I saw my own patients raising up from the dead in the United States, like Lazarus. And we used to call it, even in the medical literature, it was called the Lazarus Effect. And all I could think about was the hundreds of funerals I had gone to in Uganda, and these children who were making these Faustian deals with the devil of poverty to decide if they were going to learn to read or not and take a risk of getting AIDS or not. And in that setting of these terrible deals, nobody was talking about bringing HIV drugs to Africa. Not 96, 97, 98. 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, I mean, crazy and ticking clock. During that period, 8,000 people died a day. And so it really, you know, in a lot of ways, I don't care about AIDS, right? I don't identify myself as an AIDS doctor, I identify myself first as a human being. And this level, thank you, I, I'm glad to be welcomed into the human species. <laughs> and this level of just crushing inequality, right, just this crushing inequality that then seeps through societies and 
it boils up as a health problem, mm. right, was just so obvious to me because I listened to these young children. Right, and of course, I listened as as a as a doctor to the the patients that were suffering in the United States, and the classism, you know, is so profound. And medicine is a horrible profession when it comes to classism. You know, I remember taking care of an, uh, a man who was seemed old at the time, who was probably forty, um, <laughs> which I've way surpassed that. Um, who was who was. Uh, um, uh, addicted to heroin, and he had a disease of the heart known as endocarditis, which is not uncommon in IV drug users. And my attending physician, I was just a medical student at the time, said, why are you paying so much attention to this patient? He's just a hairball. That is happening all the time in medicine, right? And I was furious, and, and I was a student, but I felt like I still have power. I have moral power to speak out. Like, I may get a failing grade if I yell at this guy, but I will not get a failing grade in the karma calculator. And I just said, look, you know, you can't talk. That is my patient. That is our brother. That is a human being. And there is, you know, the, what has happened in this man's life? He did not have the options I had, right? He did not have. So the judgment me, we make that is then associated with an illness, that is then associated with poverty. And in some ways, I, I, I'm ashamed to say that nowhere is that judgment worse than in the United States. We have a class-based society where, you know, the idea of you do well, it's because, you know, God loves you or something. I don't know. But, you know, and, and we see it more potently now with the Trump family than we've ever seen it before. And so what does this have to do with domestic health care? So, you know, I, I think the first lesson I learned is poverty makes you sick and poverty is deeply structural. Right? You cannot look at poverty in the United States and not understand the history of slavery, of Jim Crow, of the genocide of the Native Americans, of you know, the way that, that immigrants are treated. Um, and, and so that's one important thing. Poverty makes you sick. Poverty is deeply structural. Right? And the structures we have to fight. We have to fight the structures. And so how do we do that? We fight for a social uh, contract that are known as social and economic rights. And in, I don't have enough time to really go over sort of my construction of human rights with you today, but in this country, we, we talk about human rights a lot, and it's civil and political rights, the right to free speech. But in many countries, the other human rights are also talked about, like the right to health care, the right to housing, the right to jobs, you know, to, the right to organize a labor union. Those are also rights. Those are also embedded in international treaties of human rights. But here in the United States, we look at them as a privilege, an entitlement, a something. They're not. They are human rights. And in many countries, the right to health is written into the Constitution. Countries like India, Brazil, Costa Rica, Colombia. So many countries have that in the Constitution. We do not, right? So I think. As we started to, to see that poverty, or I started to learn poverty is, is really the main issue related to health, and then the structural aspects of poverty, then where do we come in as looking at health? Well, you have to attack those structures, and you have to say what it is. You have to talk about racism. You have to talk about poverty, right? You have to talk about oppression of people. That, that has to be put out there honestly. And since many of you in this, in this room are white, I would say, you know, talk to your colleagues, your friends, your, uh, about racism openly. I, what I have learned from my friends who are black and brown is they already know it anyway. So if you don't, if you pretend it doesn't exist, they just think you're a fool, right? That's that's my experience. I don't know if uh, my friends in the audience who are black and brown would agree with me, but that is that is, or at least not openly, because they don't want to embarrass themselves. But you know, they're all thinking, well, you know, we know this is race, so just say it, just name it, right? Name poverty, you know. Um, and I think those are important things. But then the 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 other thing is there is no winning without a fight. So. When I was in that period where I was teaching young girls and boys in Uganda about HIV, there was no health care at all for poor people. 
in, in, in Africa. With just vaccines, vitamin A, prevention. Uh, prevention only. And why? Because those are black and brown people. I mean, uh, it's a very simple calculus. It's, it's the calculus of colonialism, the calculus of slavery, and you hear it now. You blame people for getting sick, and then it absolves you the responsibility of taking care of them, right? You say, well, uh, this man is hairball, right? This, this person you know, had different behaviors. Let's focus on behavior change, but the, the behavior is the way the global system creates these structures of poverty, right? That's the behavior we need to change, not an individual person's <laughs> Different behavior. So that was, you know, my upbringing. So then I come back to the United States from this learning these important lessons about poverty and what we, you know, what now I call, you know, thanks to Paul Farmer and other, you know, writers, structural violence. And I see there's this miracle treatment. Well, obviously it should go to where the burden of disease is, right? Out of equity. And nobody was talking about that. Um, until um, I stumbled upon this tiny NGO at the time, 250 people on the staff, all in Haiti, I think three Americans, uh, at Partners in Health, and we started treating HIV, as you saw in the movie. Um, and I also worked a lot in Peru uh, with almost the same story, you know, treating uh, uh, tuberculosis in, in Haiti, and, and I spent a lot of time in Peru um, in, those, in those days. Um, but without activism, we would never be where we are now. There's no way that the world would have changed. The, the structures of racism, classism, uh, nationalism were so strong that we could not have changed the gradient of inequality to get those medicines to people. We could not have done it. And that is happening now in the United States with hepatitis C. So this same fight is happening with hepatitis C. And I was at a conference you know, where we're saying we need equity in treatment of hepatitis C. This was at the WHO. And there was a person from Illinois who runs Medicaid, Medicare in Illinois. And he said, we're thinking we'll probably be able to treat about 5% of our cases. This is in Illinois, right? So, and it's the same structures, it's that the drug companies are making tons of money. They're, they're unwilling to break down those barriers of the structures of poverty and class and race. And so th that's just going to wait to trickle down. And in that waiting, people are dying. Right. So, you know, I think for me, I've worked all these years internationally, but now is the time that we have to make it one fight. Um, there was always a time, but I think it's so obvious now that it's one fight. And that one fight is to say, we have waited too long for healthcare to actually be a human right, globally. Right. And yet, you know, but, but we think of other things as a human right. You know, free speech, we think of voting, and, and those are under threat as well. So I think f leading a fight on healthcare as a human right here in the United States is a great way to have a part of a galvanizing movement globally and learn lessons from countries like Rwanda, you know, like Ethiopia, in, in which, you know, there may be other imperfections in the society and those need to be fought too. However, healthcare is considered part of the basic social contract of rights. And so, you know, that's why you all are so important and, and results is important and I'm, I'm, I'm as huge of a fan as of Joanne um, as she appears to be uh, of me and, uh, and I know she is, uh, it's mutual ad ad adoration society. Because why? Because everyday individuals have to think about this. This can't be a Washington Beltway thing. This cannot be a Harvard thing. It has to be a Kansas thing. It has to be a, a Montana thing. It has to be throughout our country the idea that health is a human right, that we're going to demand that. And this is, in fact, the time to even change ACA to Medicare for all. I mean, this is really. Um, I think we're. We're well beyond the time that health should be commodified. And I'll just end with saying, you know, at Partners in Health, because we believe that healthcare is a right, 
we believe that everyone should have access to health care, but most particularly poor people need more access to health care because they're more aggrieved, because they're sicker, right? So Because they have less op other options. So that our system has to work even better for the poorest and most marginalized communities than it does for me. And that is definitely not the case. And until that is the case, we will not have one. So that, you know, an ACA we know is a step, but it's not enough. And even when people are talking about single payer, and poor Vincent's heard me say this 60 times this summer, single payer, we should not use that word, right? Because when we say payer, it still assumes that healthcare is a commodity. I send my child to a public school in my neighborhood. I don't call it a single payer school. We drive on publicly uh, cared for roads. We do not call them single payer roads. This is part of our right as Americans, our right as human beings. And so we should just talk about health public provision of health care as a human right. Maybe that's a little wonky. Medicare for all, I can accept. But single payer, we've got to move away from that because this is not about payment and commodification of a basic right. We don't call, yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of work to do globally, um, but I'll, I'll tell you that in countries as disparate as Cuba, Denmark, Costa Rica, and Estonia, nobody calls their health care payer anything, right? Yeah. Their health care is just their health care, right? And so if we can look at a diverse set of countries like that, how can we not make it happen in the United States? And once we make it happen in the United States, then we can, you know, we can really learn lessons from other countries and help countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, you know, uh, poor countries like Liberia, those just destitute uh, have health care too. Um, we're working on that. But if in the richest country in the world we cannot make it happen, I think we're doomed. So the fight has to be one fight for health as a human right. And we cannot accept unnecessary deaths. And we cannot accept unnecessary suffering. That, that we are, live in a world with plenty of resources to do that. And the only way to win any of these fights is not by logic, not by data, is by all of you standing up, calling your congressman, you know, sitting in, getting arrested. Like, this is where we are. We have to have a movement. So thank you very much. And I'll take questions.